Welcome to the past. This is the story of what lived, fought and died in prehistoric Denver. Denver, Colorado is the US's mile high city. It stands at the foot of the Rocky Mountains in the shadow of the 4,000 meter Pikes Peak. Gold once brought prospectors to Denver who came to spend their wealth. But there's more than gold buried in Denver. Its twisted landscapes conceal masses of strange prehistoric creatures. Like many places on Earth, it has such an amazing story to tell. A billion years of history in thick layers of sediment below the surface. There's two miles of sedimentary rock, layer after layer, page after page, accumulated beneath the city of Denver. And we can read the story in those pages. A story told as we travel back through time to see one place across many different ages. 25,000 years ago, in the Ice Age Pleistocene, when the climate was cool and mammoths were hunted by early man. 37 million years ago, in the Eocene, when pig-like mammals attacked prey on a warm, open plain and where volcanoes could erupt without warning. 66 million years ago, in the Lake Cretaceous, as the Rocky Mountains built their peaks and the last of the dinosaurs battled in a tropical forest before extinction claimed them all. 85 million years ago, with Denver underwater in the mid-Cretaceous, giant serpents fought in a vast inland sea. And 150 million years ago, in the steamy Jurassic, when Brontosaurus and Stegosaurus grazed plains and forests. All of this prehistoric action took place on an ever-changing landscape, and one that left the US with the Rocky Mountains towering over the modern-day terrain. South of the city is Highlands Ranch, a typical US suburb covered with densely packed homes. But travel back 25,000 years, and the football fields of this community would have been filled with young mammoths instead of young humans. It is the late Pleistocene, a time of massive ice sheets scraping across much of North America. But the glaciers never came this far south. Ice Age Denver is cool, but not frozen solid like the northern half of the continent. The broad Denver grasslands are ideal for colossal Colombian mammoths, among the biggest elephants that ever lived. Four meters tall, nine tons in weight, and with gigantic curved tusks up to five meters long. There are still traces of those mammoths not far from the suburb of Highlands Ranch, at an archaeological preserve called Lamb Spring. Between 1960 and 2002, scientists here have uncovered the remains of 24 Colombian mammoths. At 25,000 years ago, this area would have been a vast prairie, and there would have been trees along the stream courses. So in many ways, it would be similar to what it looks like today, but the climate would have been different. The summers would have been cooler, and the winters would have been warmer. If conditions here attracted Colombian mammoths, they would also have drawn predator species, such as early humans. If you're a human hunter armed only with a spear, the one animal you do not want to attack is an elephant, or a hairy elephant, which is a mammoth, because they're very big, they're very smart, they travel in groups, and they carry grudges. So it is amazing that in the Denver area and all over Colorado, you find mammoths, giant hairy elephants, that have been speared and killed and chopped up with stone tools. The payoff is, 10 to 15,000 pounds of meat. However, there's a problem. Most scientists believe that 25,000 years ago there may have been mammoths in the US, but there were no humans. Archaeologist Steve Holand thinks that theory is just wrong. He thinks that humans came to the US long before anyone used to believe. The prevailing wisdom is that humans first entered North America 13,000 years ago, but I believe that humans were here much earlier, probably at least 25,000 years ago, based on the evidence from the archaeological sites that I have excavated in areas near here. It's widely believed that humans first came to the US across a land bridge from Siberia. They migrated south 13,000 years ago through a corridor in the ice covering Canada, probably in pursuit of mammoths and other large prey. But Holen believes there are mammoth bones much older that appear to have been smashed by human hunters. Let's try to hit the bone right here. To demonstrate his point, Holen and his wife, Kathy, take some cattle bones and do some smashing of their own. 
When any fresh bone takes a sharp impact, two things happen. First, it'll break into what's called a spiral fracture that wraps around the bone diagonally. Second, there will also be a cone-shaped fracture inside the bone, right at the point of impact. It's the same principle that you see when an air rifle pellet is shot into a pane of glass. The impact's force spreads out in a cone. This is the spiral fracture caused by the impact of the bone. And you can see that the fracture spirals around the bone like this. This is how bone breaks when it's very fresh and not on dry bones. The only agency that can break these kinds of bones at mid-shaft, especially if we had a mammoth bone here, would be humans wielding hammer stones. Here is the impact from the hammer hitting the bone. The analogy that I always use is a BB hitting your windshield or hitting glass and making that cone shape. And here we have the negative of the cone right here, this very sharp angle extending back into the marrow cavity. If prehistoric humans were pounding on bones earlier than 13,000 years ago, then the fossils that survive today should show the same kind of fractures Holan produced on modern bones. This is a mammoth femur from a site that's 20,000 years old, and it is broken by a large impact point. Here you can see the semicircular notch showing the side uh, of the impactor as it hit, and on this piece, we turn it, and you can see the negative cone of percussion. These kind of fracture patterns can only have been caused by humans wielding hammer stones. Radiocarbon dating proves these bones are 20,000 years old. This means that humans hunted mammoth near Denver at least that long ago. And because Canada was blocked with ice at that time, human migration may have started much earlier. They had to come in maybe 20 to 25,000 years ago, and people were probably living right in this place 25,000 years ago. But millions of years before mammoths and man roamed Denver's countryside, this land was ruled by a menagerie of strange creatures. From a hideous pig-like predator in the age of mammals to Tyrannosaurus rex. Denver, the United States, and the imprint of ancient history is everywhere. The distant past has a way of reaching out across the epochs of time to grab our attention. It happens even where we least expect it. Just a short distance from the state's capitol building is the Molly Brown House. It's a tourist attraction because it was the home of Molly Brown, a Denver socialite and survivor of the Titanic disaster. But paleontologist Richard Stuckey is interested for another reason. I find it interesting because it's made of all of these blocks, which are called Castle Rock Rhyolite, which is a rock that formed in the Denver region about 37 million years ago. Travel back 37 million years ago. It is the late Eocene epoch, and although Denver's position on Earth is much as it is today, the climate is warmer and the forests much more extensive. Among the most remarkable creatures of the time is a strange mammal whose name means ancient beast. The Archaeotherium. A kind of creature that only a mother could love. Archaeotherium. We call it kind of a pig-like animal, but it was really ugly. Really, really ugly. It had wart-like little protuberances that came off of its jaw, and then it had flanges that stuck out on the side. It was really an odd-looking beast, not like anything today, except maybe a warthog. Denver's Archaeotherium would stop traffic in today's city streets. In its own time, it was a terrifying predator, a creature that could be called the Terminator pig. It's over two meters long and weighs over 90 kilograms. It's equipped with slender legs for fast running and has an oversized head with powerful jaws and sharp teeth. 37 million years ago, the Terminator pig's favorite prey was the Oreodont. It's a plant eater the size of a lamb and more distinct for its numbers than anything else. It is as common as cattle is on the modern day Colorado range. This is an oreodon. If you can think of an animal that was generic, you know, just your average animal, that was an oreodon. These things were all over the place. An oreodont has few defenses against a hungry archaeotherium. We'd think that they would have grabbed the animal by the neck and pulled it down, and immediately you know, the animal would have been killed by the breaking of its neck or you know, the chomping down of the animal. But the scene is suddenly interrupted, and everything comes to a halt. Because on this day, and without warning, 
a massive volcano 160 kilometers away blows its top, sending a gigantic column of ash sky high. 36.7 million years ago, there was a massive eruption in south central Colorado, and it blew a huge amount of molten volcanic ash into the sky, creating what we call the Castle Rock Rhyolite. I call it airborne death rock, because it's molten rock falling out of the sky, landing on the surface, and burying it up to 20 feet deep. So if you were there in Colorado on that day, you would have been entombed in a rock that, as it hit, was so hot that it fused together and made a rhyolite, or a fused volcanic rock. The Rhyolite is named for Castle Rock, which is the butte that's located just above the town of Castle Rock, Colorado. Castle Rock is 45 kilometers south of central Denver. The butte itself is 150 meters high, a dense, hard conglomerate of rhyolite and other materials left over when softer rocks weathered away. Rhyolite is strong, lightweight, and was valued as a building material for generations in Denver. When construction crews build anything in Denver, they have a good chance of finding the city's most thrilling residence. It's dinosaurs. That's why a triple horn triceratops is the mascot for the US baseball team, the Colorado Rockies. The club chose the famous giant plant-eating dinosaur because their stadium was built on one of the world's richest dinosaur areas. 1993, when they were building Coors Field, they uncovered this piece of dinosaur bone right here in front of the visitor's dugout. This bone is a piece of dinosaur rib. We don't know what dinosaur it's from, but we do know that Triceratops is the most common dinosaur that's found in the Denver area. So it seems reasonable that this is, in fact, the rib of a Triceratops. Travel back 66 million years ago, when a Triceratops treading the turf of the Colorado Rockies would be surrounded by a Cretaceous forest. Triceratops is a dinosaur that belongs to Denver because the first set of horns was found near Denver. But a few years later, this was 1888 in Wyoming, they found a complete skull, and it, the skull was fantastic. A huge frill of armor like a medieval knight in the back. Over the eyes, these fantastic, curved, incredibly strong horns. Probably the most dangerous animal ever to have evolved on land, and it was a plant eater. If there's any question that a big horned and armored plant eater can be dangerous, think rhinoceros. No one wants to be anywhere near a charging rhino. A two to four and a half ton Triceratops was every bit a dinosaur rhino. It lived during the Cretaceous, the most recent of three time periods of the dinosaur age, where they ruled for more than 160 million years. The climate in Denver for Triceratops was like a tropical resort. The Cretaceous Earth had six times more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than today, contributing to a warm climate worldwide. It's also the time when the Rocky Mountains arose. Fossil finds like these are far from unusual in Denver. Buried below ground are slithering sea monsters, bizarre flying reptiles, and more. So Americans don't need to travel to the ends of the Earth to find dinosaur fossils. They can just go to Denver, where bones can show up anywhere, as happened in 1992. On an ordinary street in Littleton, Colorado, about 50 miles south of central Denver. This backyard was once trampled on by the most vicious of all dinosaurs, a Tyrannosaurus rex. When this home was under construction, workers uncovered some bones. They called in the scientists who told them a T-Rex used to live here. Because this was indeed a housing development and this was basically in this backyard, it really is the only Tyrannosaurus rex in the whole world with its own street address. While a T-Rex in the neighborhood may be unlikely elsewhere, in Denver, it goes with the territory. In this area, someone starts digging, there's a very good chance that they could find something. Practically anybody could find their own dinosaur. Travel back 66 million years ago. The dinosaur prowling the neighborhood is the fearsome Tyrannosaurus rex, the largest meat eater that ever lived in Denver or elsewhere in North America. Four and a half tons in weight, 13 meters from head to tail. Its frightening teeth were not sharp for tearing flesh, but blunt for crushing bones. The teeth of Tyrannosaurus rex are really formidable. Unlike a lot of carnivorous dinosaurs, it's not a thin, narrow blade, but it is, in fact, rather massive. It's almost like a banana. You could think of it as a killer banana. We can imagine this just cutting right through flesh and bone. And with that huge skull, those massive jaws could easily deliver on the tip of these teeth several tons of pressure. In the Denver of 66 million years ago, T-Rex was the top predator. 
In a world shared with Triceratops, it seems inevitable that the two of them would meet. In dinosaur lore, the contest is a classic one. Why was Triceratops so heavily armored and armed and deadly? Because it was involved in a Darwinian arms race. T-Rex had the strongest jaws and bone-crushing teeth. Triceratops had the thickest bone armor over the neck and the deadliest horns. So Triceratops is a self-propelled armored plant eater, and T-Rex is a self-propelled anti-tank gun. Their meeting is a clash of the titans. New fossils, in fact, show evidence of deep T-Rex bite marks on a Triceratops horn, hinting at what a fight between these two dinosaurs might have been like. It starts with the T-Rex on the prowl. He then notices his prey and begins to approach. The Triceratops, a plant eater, is grazing in the forest. His sharp horns could wound even a T-Rex. The Tyrannosaurus sneaks up from behind, aiming for the sides or hind quarters where the Triceratops is most vulnerable. When he's ready, he charges. Triceratops is surprised. It's too late to run. Despite his almost three tons, he pivots quickly, pointing his three horns directly at the attacker. The fossil evidence shows that in this battle, the T-Rex bit down on the deadly horns. But the Triceratops must have shaken it off, because the bite scars on the fossil horns were healed over, meaning this Triceratops escaped. We don't know how often battles like this happened in prehistoric Denver, or how many times the tables were turned and T-Rex ended up as the winner. But the dinosaur's reign on Earth came to a sudden, shocking end 65 million years ago, perhaps with the crash of a massive asteroid. Plunging the world into a climactic nightmare. It was the end of a prolonged age that had brought creatures like the giant Brontosaurus and the oddly plated Stegosaurus to Denver's terrain. And while the dinosaurs dominated most of the world's continents for 160 million years, Denver's experience was different. For 30 million of those years, just before T Rex and Triceratops, there were no dinosaurs in Denver at all. Why? because what is now a vast western plain was once totally underwater. Denver in the US is known as the Mile High City, but this place was once an ocean instead of a plain. Travel back 85 million years ago. If the state capitol building were standing, it would be under 180 meters of water. It is the middle Cretaceous period, and the atmosphere's high CO2 content keeps the planet very warm. With no ice caps to tie up water, ocean levels are at an all-time high, and a thousand kilometer wide sea splits North America in half. The body of water that covered the Midwest and North America during the late Cretaceous was called the Western Interior Seaway. It stretched all the way from the Gulf up into Canada, and probably from roughly Missouri clear out to Utah. If Denver's skyscrapers had been in place, only the three tallest would be visible above the surface. And while dinosaurs are thriving all over the world, none of them live here 85 million years ago. This is because Denver is now underwater, 240 kilometers away from the nearest coast. Dinosaurs are reptiles with legs held erect beneath their bodies, unlike many other reptiles that have sprawling limbs like crocodiles. But stranger kinds of reptiles live in and around Denver's ocean. Above the seaway, a pair of pteranodons fly across the water. Pteranodons are the largest of the pterodactyl family, capable of soaring vast distances on seven and a half meter wings. Unlike birds, whose wing feathers are supported by the full length of their arm bones, the pteranodon's wings are each suspended from a single finger. Imagine you could pull this finger, here, pull my finger, so that it's 10 feet long, and ditto this finger 10 feet long, and attach the entire wing to this one finger. A pterodactyl finger is thicker around than its thigh. All the power, the downstroke, the upstroke, comes from that finger. That's a uniquely pterodactyl way of building a wing. We find thousands of their remains in the middle of the seaway. Uh, they died either feeding here or flying over the seaway and uh, left their bones in large numbers. Below the water surface, the seaway in Denver is teeming with life as well. Spectacular among these ocean dwellers is the plesiosaur, 
a long-necked swimming reptile the size of a school bus. The biggest ones that we have are about 40 foot long, and they have a 20 foot neck and a very small head. They move through the water by literally flying with two pairs of flippers that are basically wings. Probably move fairly slowly, probably were fairly graceful. Though they were water dwellers, plesiosaurs were reptiles that had to surface to breathe air. However, they were not like Loch Ness monsters, as history once portrayed them. A lot of the pictures show this great swan-like neck sticking up above the water. But truth is, that's physically impossible. Not only can't you lift that thing out of the water because gravity will pull it back down, they simply didn't have the muscles and their bones were not that flexible. Their long necks allowed them to feed by sneaking up on fish from below, swiftly killing with their sharp teeth before ever being seen. But plesiosaurs' small heads made them unable to go after large prey. Instead, that role went to the forbidding mosasaur, the closest thing to the legendary sea serpent the Earth has ever seen. It was the Tyrannosaurus rex of the oceans, a grisly carnivore in a class of its own. They were the, the supreme predator, the apex predator, in all of the oceans of the Earth for, the, say, the last 25 million years of the Cretaceous. There was literally nothing out there to compete with them. Like plesiosaurs, these were reptiles that needed to surface to breathe air, but the water was their kingdom. Over 15 meters long and weighing 5,000 kilograms, mosasaurs swam with a snake-like motion. They had gaping mouths and skulls more than a meter long, designed to attack, kill, and consume large prey. A full-grown plesiosaur would be too big for a mosasaur meal, but a meter-wide 63-kilogram juvenile would fit perfectly down the mosasaur's throat. Their skulls were very flexible, very much like a snake, in that they could engulf their prey and slowly work it down their throat and swallow it all in one piece. And then he would have come to a stop in the water and would have been slowly working the, the prey back into his mouth. And when mosasaurs were not terrorizing other creatures in Denver's prehistoric sea, there's good evidence that they were venting their violent attitudes on each other. Once you get to this 30 or 40 foot size, the only danger to you out there is other mosasaurs. We find lots of mosasaur skeletons that have bite marks or broken ribs or other healed injuries that could have only come from another mosasaur. So it's likely that they were pre combative among themselves. The rising and falling of landscapes that brought the oceans to Denver would later create the Rocky Mountains. This period of time when the seas split the US in half led to a break in dinosaurs roaming Denver. But dinosaurs did reign here before the seas rolled in. History's procession of massive dinosaurs thundering across the landscape of prehistoric Denver is dazzlingly clear at a place called Dinosaur Ridge. It's about 24 kilometers to the west of the city center. Here in the 1930s, men carving a road out of a rocky hillside uncovered sets of dinosaur tracks on a patch of earth, now known as the Dinosaur Freeway. And down the road in 1877, scientists discovered the world's first Stegosaurus and Brontosaurus, two celebrities of the dinosaur age. Everything here has gone through a slow, grueling process that turns living things and landforms into solid stone. To take a modern landscape and to fossilize it, you need to literally bury that landscape and have rock accumulate on top of it so that the landscape today becomes fossilized, it becomes indurated, hardened, lithified, solidified, and then we can see it as rocks. Here in some places, evidence of dinosaurs is obvious, while in others, it's more subtle. For instance, when you see a series of rock bulges, all in a row, all in the same layer, it means one of the big creatures probably made them. This feature might just look like a bulge in the rocks to you, but it's not. It's something much more exciting. This is actually the footprint of a giant dinosaur, a dinosaur called Apatosaurus that lived here 150 million years ago. Travel back 150 million years ago. It is the Jurassic period in the middle of the age of dinosaurs. The inland sea that will keep dinosaurs away from Denver has not yet arrived. The terrain is probably a landscape rich with ferns in a world where grasses have not yet evolved. Apatosaurus, also known as Brontosaurus, is a sauropod, 
a class of long-necked plant-eating dinosaur, colossal in size. Sauropod dinosaurs are not only the biggest dinosaurs, but the biggest animals of any sort ever to walk on land. Up to 80 tons, which is 10 or 15 times bigger than a big elephant. This is immense. Sauropods have very large guts. And to break down the food, they probably engage in fermentation, breaking it down by bacteria. That would release an incredible amount of gas. And the last thing you'd want to do is be downwind of a herd of sauropods. The bulging footprints at Dinosaur Ridge happened to be located near the spot where the very first Apatosaurus was discovered back in 1877. Two years later, larger fossils were found and named Brontosaurus, although it was eventually discovered that the two sets of bones actually belonged to the same species. Apatosaurus, named first, is considered the correct name, even if Brontosaurus remains more popular. But when a spectacular skeleton was put on display in 1905, it was labelled Brontosaurus. The exhibit was very popular with the public, and the name stuck for generations of dinosaur lovers. The US Postal Service even continued the tradition by using the Brontosaurus name on a postage stamp, because it claimed people knew Brontosaurus, but not Apatosaurus. Today, those scientists are gaining ground in making the correct name better known. Brontosaurus is probably the more common name, at least for adults, simply because that was the name we grew up with. Children today, they're getting used to Apatosaurus, and so that's the name that they will grow up with. The Colorado contemporary of Apatosaurus is the state fossil with a menacing profile unlike any other, the Stegosaurus. Four meters high, nine meters long, and weighing four and a half tons, this big beast was actually a peaceful plant eater. Stegosaurus is easily recognized by the distinctive plates on its spine. Trouble is, no one really knows what they're there for. Some have suggested that maybe it was for controlling body temperature. But a more, I think, believable scenario based on studies of modern animals is that the plates were actually used for display, for show. Because so many other animals have such displays, it's thought that the Stegosaurus plates might have been used to ward off predators, or even to attract the opposite sex with a multicolored twist. I think that when the blood flow was increased into the plates, it was sort of blush. It might stand out as pink, or it might even been rather more on the red side. It certainly would definitely make that animal stand out. It would certainly shout, stay away. On the other hand, it could also say, hey baby, look at me, I'm pretty cool. I'm the one you want to mate with. The Stegosaurus has often been given a tough time because of its small brain. But then it was also once thought to have a second brain in a chamber between its hips. Was this a creature with a split personality? In reality, that second brain is not for thinking. It's just a swelling of the spinal cord. And that swelling is in order to control the muscles to the hind leg as well as the muscles on the tail. The Stegosaurus's actual brain was about the same size as a dog's, small in relation to its massive body weight. But it must have been enough because Stegosaurus thrived for five million years. The dark brown fossils of Stegosaurus bones remain embedded in rock at Dinosaur Ridge, where that first specimen was found in 1877. Elsewhere, Denver's astonishing landforms provide other tantalizing clues to the ancient past. These slabs and pillars of rock tell the tale of Denver's defining feature, how the very ceiling of this landscape exploded into jagged peaks bursting skyward to become the Rocky Mountains. The city of Denver is defined by its Rocky Mountain backdrop, but incredibly, these are actually the second set of Rockies to have risen from the earth here. The modern Rockies arose 68 million years ago, during the late Cretaceous period when dinosaurs still roamed. It was a process that would continue for another 20 million years. The birth of these Rockies was Denver's greatest geological transformation. The creation of a mountain range so massive that it dominates the terrain and forms the continental divide. The peaks are the high point from which all waters in the US drain either east or west. The Rockies formed as the plates of the Earth's crust were on the move. The Pacific Plate collided with North America, pushing up the Sierra Nevadas in the west, as well as the Rockies further inland. But just how it happened remains a puzzle. Here's the problem. Unlike most mountain ranges, which are formed by the edges of continents or by the collisions of continents, the Rocky Mountains are in the middle of a continent. 
So how do you have a plate hit California and make mountains in Colorado? It doesn't make much mechanical sense. Some people think it was related to the plates, the oceanic plates bumping into North America, and how that plate behaved once it hit the continent. So instead of subducting deeply and making volcanoes in California, it subducted shallowly and created stresses in the middle of the continent, which caused the Rocky Mountains to pop up. This is the second time there have been forces like these at work in Denver's backyard. The first mountain range to tower over the plain here is called the Ancestral Rockies. Travel back 300 million years ago. It is the Paleozoic era, more than 50 million years before the first dinosaurs would arrive. The Ancestral Rockies border the lowlands, and Denver's residents are amphibians and fin-backed reptiles like the Dimetrodon. Its fin probably regulated body heat and may also have served as a display like the Stegosaurus many years later. Dimetrodons are considered proto-mammals, early reptiles without scales destined to evolve into fully-fledged mammals. Other strange creatures of the era included dragonflies and millipedes that crawled in the prehistoric forests and grew as big as three meters long due to an ancient atmosphere much richer in oxygen than it is today. Signs of the Paleozoic are out in the open, an hour's drive south of Denver, at the Garden of the Gods. Here, what's left of the ancestral Rockies has been crushed down to sand, compressed into rock, and exposed in a striking display of prehistoric past. We're here in Garden of the Gods near Colorado Springs, and that is balanced rock. Colorado is a mountain state, and these rocks actually tell a story about previous mountain ranges. And what we're looking at, actually, is the ground up debris from a mountain range that was here 300 million years ago. Elsewhere in the Garden of the Gods, the jagged spires and ridges are typical of the Front Range, Denver's section of today's mountains. When the modern Rockies formed, they pushed through millions of years' worth of overlying rocks, thrusting them into bizarre positions that somehow seem unnatural. We have layers of rock here. Layers of conglomerate, sandstone, conglomerate, conglomerate. But these are sedimentary rocks, and sedimentary rocks, when they're deposited, are laid down horizontally. So what you're looking at are layers of rock that were originally deposited like this, and then the forces of mountain building were pushed up, up, up during the formation of the Rocky Mountains to the present vertical orientation. But enough remains to span the breadth of Denver's story. The thundering gate of the land's largest animals. The inflamed display of the agitated Stegosaurus. The watery combat of giant sea snakes. The clash of titans when dinosaurs ruled. The predator and its prey, both before and after the arrival of man. And the promise of gold giving birth to a city. Today, the Rocky Mountains dominate the landscape. They are the ultimate symbol of time and change, a constant reminder of this city's history, further back beyond its origin as a mining town, when it was prehistoric Denver. Denver.